Um, there are two things on the schedule for tonight. One is I'm going to spend, um, I don't know, the first 10 minutes or so talking about wordiness and writing um, because it's an issue that I've probably raised on, on several of your, your essays to date. Um, and then we'll talk about the preparation for the week four essay, um, which is your revision of the media review, um, specifically that you have to add a new piece of information to your, to your review uh, dealing with unexpected audience. First, let me start sharing my screen. Um, I assume people can see this, right? You can see my screen. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure who, but there, there, there's someone out there I think has um, family members around, children, um, a dog barking. If that's you, you might want to mute yourself. There's a little micro, uh, microphone icon in the top left of your go-to yeah. control panel. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then when things get quieter, you can unmute yourself, or when you're ready to talk, you can unmute yourself. Okay, let's get let's get moving. Uh, this is on wordiness and writing, how to spot it and stamp it out. Um, and actually, I'd like to begin with a question, which is why do so many of us write sentences like this? It seems to me that it does not make sense to allow any bail to be granted to anyone who has ever been convicted of violent crime. Instead of, bail should not be granted to anyone who has ever been convicted of a violent crime. So before we get uh, in, in, in detail with examples, I, I, I just want to throw that out there. Like, why do people slip into wordiness? Do you, uh, can, you, can you identify any reasons? Okay, Sierra types in the uh, chat window the need to elaborate. Um, okay, yeah, I get that. How about Trying others? Trying to hit a word count. Trying to hit a word count. Actually, that's a great answer because um, there are practical realities, right? The uh, The assignment said it has to be between 400 and 700 words, so you start playing that game where you have 350 words, but you need more, so you start padding sentences. Um, I get that to a certain degree. I've been there. I was an undergraduate once a long, long time ago. Uh, but that's not really the solution. Yeah, but word count is, 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 is a popular one. Um, any other ideas? Like why we slip into using more words than we have to? I know I personally do the it seems or I believe. Right. And I just thought I was, because I was writing in the first person. But, uh, but it does sound a lot better if you don't put that. Yeah, here's a quick – I think I've been repeating that to a number of people when I've been writing feedback on essays that you don't need to say I believe or I feel or it's my opinion that because if you're writing the paper, the reader already understands that these are your opinions, these are your beliefs. It's not that first person writing from the I or me perspective is, is wrong, but it's really only necessary if your personal experiences are somehow important. So let's say you're writing a movie review and you want to write an introduction where you, you describe your uh, experience seeing, for example, I don't know, Iron Man 3 this past weekend. Um, if you can do that in a way that's interesting and hooks the reader, then sure, first person works great there. But otherwise, it seems like filler, um, as in this sentence here. Um, here's some other reasons. These are just reasons I come up with. Um, sometimes students are rewarded in high school for being wordy. And by that, I mean, I, I know we have a, a pretty big age range in terms of students here at Full Sail, but if you can remember high school, you know, you're in class and your teacher, let's call her Miss Johnson. You know, Miss Johnson's got a lot of students. Uh, some of them are half asleep. Some of them are high on drugs. Um, so when you write your essay that has sentences like the one we just looked at here, it seems to me that it does not... Uh, Oh, Miss Johnson is so happy because uh, uh, from her perspective, you know, you're doing great. And in a way you are. I mean, if I go back to that sentence, one of the things that's attractive about it is it, it sounds nice. I mean, if you don't read it with that sort of what I call a BS detector, um, like it has a rhythm to it. It seems to me that it does not make sense to allow blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's one of the appeals of it is that it's sort of uh, wordiness can establish a rhythm. Uh, but you can you can do the same thing with with fewer words. Uh, students are influenced by what I like to call the official style. 
This is the language that politicians, lawyers, and other professionals use. That should say use, by the way. Bad proofreading on my part. Um, but yeah, if you've ever heard a politician stand and speak before the press, uh, you, you should be able to relate to what I'm talking about. They always seem to take about 20 words where seven or eight will do. But from our perspective, we think, well, these people are intelligent. They're well-educated. This must be the way that intelligent people speak. Um, you know, not entirely. And finally, yeah, what I just kind of covered, the wordiness sometimes sounds good. Um, things like it seems to me or I believe, they're kind of these prefabricated filler phrases that we can just stick in there. They're almost like template phrases. Um, and they're appealing because they kind of already do the work for us. Okay, so let's look at, at some examples. Uh, here's a before. The before, obviously, is, is the wordy one, and then we'll look at a revision. This one reads, after having completed work on the data entry problem, we turned our thinking toward our next pro excuse me, task, which was the processing problem. Um, what, what I'd like you to do is either just point out the, the spots that seem like they're just filler, or you can uh, try to use the chat window to suggest a revision, um, either way. Uh, but where are the where are like the BS points in this sentence? Where does it just feel like it's slipping into filler? Are thinking towards an S task? Okay, good. Yeah, there's got to be a simpler way to say that, right? It sounds fancy. We turned our thinking toward our next task. Um, yeah, that could be said in fewer words. Good. Um, anything else in the sentence that feels like filler? After having? Yeah, sure. That whole beginning there, after having completed work on. Uh, you can tell I'm kind of exaggerating my tone a little bit, and that's a good way to tell when there's filler. Like, if you can slip into that sort of robot, super formal voice, after having completed work on, we turn our thinking toward. Um, that's a good way to test when you're slipping into filler there. Uh, but yeah, the, the basis of the basics of the sentence are pretty simple. That after finishing the data entry problem, we turn to the next task, a processing problem. And my revision is, is pretty similar to that. Right. Okay. First, yeah, here's what we just went over. Identify the filler or empty words and then replace them, edit them. Uh, after completing the data entry problem, we turn to the next task, the processing problem. It's the same information, the exact same, but it's shorter, it's tighter, it's more focused. And, you know, usually at this point, there's there's someone who s speaks up or writes in the chat window that, oh, but that's not my style. And to that, I say a couple things. First of all, wordiness isn't style, right? Taking, uh, using 20 words to say something when 10 will do is not style. That doesn't mean that there aren't gorgeous long sentences out there. This isn't a creative writing class, but you know, if, if I, I could bring examples from, for example, fiction, where there are gorgeous sentences, lengthy and long, but every word counts. Like there's not a there's not a, a piece of fat anywhere in this in, in those sentences. Uh, so it's not about writing short baby sentences or writing short super direct sentences because those are only the only good ones. It's about only using the the, the right amount of words needed. Um, Okay, how about this one? Where is the filler or the, the the BS or the padding, the fat in this one? Being comprised of nine different sections, the entire proposal consists of 500 pages of crucial, relevant information. I barely heard someone there. Yeah, that's that's me. The entire proposal. Okay, good. I mean, the entire proposal, right? If we're talking about the proposal, we can kind of assume that it's the entire thing. So yeah, the word "entire" is 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 unneeded. Uh, good. Anything else in there that sounds like filler? Uh, Sierra says different, um, being comprised of nine different sections. Yeah, different is, is kind of crucial. crucial. Yeah, and you, as you'll see in crucial. a second, right, good. Um, 
you'll see in my revision, I actually keep crucial and relevant, but that's actually a mistake. I should fix that because uh, crucial and relevant, they're not synonyms exactly, but they're pretty close in meaning. Um, so you could probably use one of those words, not both. And uh, Sierra's on the right track with the, the different thing, too. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, if, if, if you have nine sections, we don't think that there are nine sections that are all the same. Uh, but yeah, another kind of filler sentence. And here it is uh, revised. The 550-page proposal divided into nine sections contains crucial relevant information. And as someone else suggested, we could probably lose one of those words toward the end there. Um, again, as you can see, same information, fewer words. Um, I'll try to whip through these last two examples because we kind of have a shy group here. Uh, referring back to the earlier uh, statement regarding the shortage of funds, I have come to the conclusion that a solution must be found. Um, I like to call this the drum roll sentence because it's sort of like, here comes the sentence, here comes the sentence. And you can imagine a person kind of, you know, uh, playing away on the drum to kind of heighten anticipation because um, it's this long buildup, right? It's like, here comes the sentence, here comes the sentence. Um, and all of that stuff, referring back to the earlier statement regarding a shorter function, I've come to the conclusion that. And then really the core part of the sentence is what finally comes. A solution must be found. Uh, essentially, this is a lot of window dressing to say that uh, regarding the shortage of funds, a solution must be found. And I think my revision says something like that. Yeah, an immediate solution to the funding shortage must be found. Now, if that's too drastic or too, too draconian, I mean, sure, you can put a short phrase before that or a short phrase tacked onto the end. But the, the gist here is to avoid those, those overwhelmingly uh, filler-like components that are found in the sentences. Um, and, and real quickly, just in this last one, this, this sentence is pretty tight. The only thing I want to suggest here is that even small phrases can be replaced. Like in many cases, don't we have a single word that more or less means in many cases? Um, like often. often, I think I, I think it interrupts to someone. Someone's going to say something. Yeah, I said often. Oh, okay. Or maybe due to the fact that. I mean, don't again. Don't we have a single word that kind of means due to the fact that? Because? Right, because. So even in this sentence, which isn't that bad. I mean, if I'm reading this and it's in your essay, I might not even notice that it's a tad wordy because it's, it's pretty f tight and focused. But um, when you've been doing this a long time, you, you learn how to spot the wordiness. By the way, I was having a conversation with a student earlier on IM who said that it's, it's difficult to see the wordiness. And I said, yeah, that's true. It's, it's sort of like those paintings, you know, those paintings that from afar look like they're just... A, mirage, a, a melange of, you know, nothingness. But if you stare at it long enough, you can see the image. Um, spotting wordiness takes time. I mean, it comes with time. It comes with practice. Um, and the more you read, the more you write, the more you'll get accustomed to, to, to learning these, these sorts of tricks. So, yeah. And there's a revision. Often the situation exists because women are not given job art for two weeks. Okay. Do we get the gist of that lesson? Let me, sw let me switch gears here. Yeah, uh, experience has taught me that I can only spend about 15 minutes on grammar because people start passing out. I think this group is just a little bit quiet, but I don't want to push grammar too much longer than that. Okay, I actually don't have a presentation on this next topic. I'm just putting up the slide here because it kind of reminds us what we're talking about. Uh, okay, for this Saturday, you're, you're working on the Think Sheet, which is a pretty simple assignment, so I don't really need to have a go-to session to prepare you for that. But after Memorial Day, you get to come back and focus on the Week 4 essay, which is a revision of your media review that you wrote in Week 1. Um, You'll take the feedback that I gave you from that essay, try to fix whatever I might have mentioned or whatever you think needs fixing that maybe I didn't mention. Uh, but in addition to revising on that level, you're going to add two new pieces of information. First, you're going to find an opportunity or two to slide in some research. That's what the purpose of the week two assignment was for you to find an article that you thought was useful on your pop culture item so that during week four, you could then cite from it or quote from it. So there's uh, addition number one right there. In the revision, you'll add, you'll find an opportunity or two uh, to include a short quotation to, to better support what you're saying. 
And second, you'll have to add a new paragraph, probably near the end of the, the revised essay, where you discuss um, unexpected audience, which is also what you've been talking about for this week's discussion. Um, and the reason for this is because we're trying to make students more aware of audience. Um, and I would argue that if you think about the real world reviews that exist out there, right, you can read movie reviews, game reviews, what have you. Um, okay, they don't literally at any moment state an unexpected audience or a target audience like we do in these essays. But I would argue that all writing is persuasive. And in the case of a review, a really good review can tempt someone who maybe isn't that interested in the item to give it a try. Um, if you think back to those materials for the week one assignment, I think I used the movie Cabin in the Woods as an example for, for how to establish criteria. Um, by the way, I'm just curious, has anybody seen that movie Cabin in the Woods or have you heard of it? Yes. No. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some people are saying yes. Some people are saying so. no. Um, it basically, if you watch a trailer, it looks like a pretty standard horror film. Right, a bunch of young kids go off to a cabin in, in the woods, and there's a killer. So it's, it sounds like almost like it's a retread of Friday the Thirteenth or something. And by the way, I should state in advance that like I'm not really into horror films. I'm not thrilled about being scared. Um, don't really like lots of violence or blood or guts. Although I do like it in action movies. I don't know why that is, but but, but in horror movies, it seems like too over the top and. I just don't find people being terrorized and slaughtered all that entertaining. Not, not that I'm putting a value judgment if you do like horror movies, but it's not typically a genre that I'll watch. But I would argue that Cabin in the Woods, and if you haven't seen it, I won't spoil anything, but it's not really a horror movie. It's a film that's also kind of about filmmaking. It's a film that's about the conventions of horror films. I mean, it's a really, really smart film. Um... So even though I typically would never watch a film like that, on its surface at least, um, you could say that I'm an unexpected audience because normally I would just pass on a movie like that. But there was, you know, the reviews that I read, I, I do read lots of reviews, by the way, of, of all sorts of things. Um, it made me interested. And for those of you who are here for the week one session, I also uh, the go-to session, I mean, I also revealed during that live session that I'm a big fan of Joss Whedon. Um, he directed the Avengers. He had several successful television series. He also wrote Cabin in the Woods. So, uh, you know, uh, there, there there was sort of a fanboy component there where I knew that I wanted to see it. But even if I hadn't, I would have been intrigued. Um, and if I were writing a paper on Cabin in the Woods and I had, a, I had to identify a specific unexpected audience, meaning someone who would typically pass on a film like that, but if they could give it a try, they'd love it, I would identify maybe fans of like experimental films or indie films because there's something similar about cabin in the woods and that yeah you watch the trailer and think it's maybe some mindless horror movie but it's actually very very kind of smart and it plays with conventions and it's it's more cerebral than you would think although when you watch it it's not like deep or anything but there's there's smarter things going underneath the, underneath the surface so that would be like my unexpected audience, like fans of indie films, fans of experimental films, uh, to give Cabin in the Woods a shot. So now what we're going to do is I'd like to hear from uh, those of you in attendance what you're writing about and what you think is a, um unexpected audience. So you can either speak up or use the chat window. Uh, who would like to jump in first? I'll go first. Okay. My, my name is Matthew Byer. Uh, I'm writing about the movie Heat. It was directed by Michael Mann, written and directed by him. Uh, it's, according to IMDb and several other things, it's an action crime drama. And I think that's actually a pretty good description. But it was geared, when it was advertised, it was basically more of an action movie. Uh, but it has a lot of drama. And I, I think the unexpected audience for that movie, because of the drama, would be women. Like that's a it's an action movie that draws in women and maybe loses some action action motivated people because of the fact that it's it's got so much drama. Okay, yeah, I think you're on the right path there. I I think I said in week one that I saw Heat basically when it came out, and I don't think I've seen it since. But you're right. I mean, it's if you probably 
the trailer emphasizes the action aspects, but it's a long movie and there are plenty of sections where there's, where there's no action going on. And so it's probably more fitting to, to call it a drama than a, than a pure adrenaline action movie. Um, but I'm trying to remember, are there even, are there women in that film? Uh, the, it's based or it kind of revolves around the wives of two of the characters. Oh, okay. Uh, Vincent Hanna's wife, which is Al Pacino, is, uh, I think her name is Diane Venora. Apparently she's famous. Uh, and then Charlie, Charlie, or Charlize Theron play, or no, Ashley Judd, actually. Ashley Judd plays Val Kilmer's wife. Oh, okay. You can tell it's been a long time since I've seen it. I don't even remember. Uh, are they featured pretty prominently in the movie, or do they have a decent part? I mean... Uh, the movie is it's based around them. They don't have much of a speaking role, but they they cause a lot of the drama. Okay, because I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to think. True, women will will be interested in watching a good drama, but see, this is where I feel frustrated because I'm not sure how many other people in the the room here have seen Heat or could comment on it. Um, by the way, adultery. Uh, okay. Yeah, by the way, I'm not disagreeing. I'm not disagreeing. It's not like I'll read your paper and go, oh, I don't believe this and, you know, give it an F or something. I'm just trying to, to think it through out loud here. Um, because I would, I, what am I trying to say? I guess I would say like a, a movie like Rocky, I guess, is a drama, but I'm not sure that it necessarily would, would reel in women. So I guess I'm just playing devil's advocate and making sure that Heat has enough to it that, that women would be drawn to it. Does that make sense? It does. It does. My wife, she doesn't like most action movies, but this has enough wording, and you get to know the characters enough to where, to where women like it. Okay. Or yeah. That, my wife. Okay. Yeah. Then I'd stick with that. And even even where you were beginning sounded like a, a good enough area for an unexpected audience. You know that fans of of of, of drama, character driven dramas, would would appreciate the film because, you know, it's not just an action film. Um, okay. Thank you, sir. Who else wants to speak up? And for those of you who are uh, quiet, you, you should start using the chat window to explain what your topic is and what your unexpected audience would be. Uh, but yeah, could... I'll... Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, is, this is Jeremy Weidinger. Uh, yeah, I'm doing my paper on uh, Babylon 5. It was a sci-fi series that ran for five years in the 90s. Um, it was a pretty innovative uh, series at the time, whereas uh, it had a uh, Michael J. Straczynski, when he created this show, he had a beginning, a middle, and an end uh, of this series. And within this series, there was a lot of um, a lot of faith and uh, religious aspects in this woven into this series. And I believe that. Um, my uh, unintended audience would be, uh, you know, people of faith, you know, Christianity, Buddhism, whatever. Yeah, and I remember you writing that in the discussion forum, and I even responded to it saying it's, an, it's interesting. Um, I actually watched most of Babylon 5. I never got through the final season, so it's it's difficult for me to remember. But real quickly, refresh us. Like, why would people of faith particularly be interested in Babylon 5? Um, well, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, it deals a lot with uh, destiny, um, and there's... They actually do have a few episodes uh, where they're dealing with... Um, um, actually, the episode is called Crisis of Faith, and they're dealing with uh, uh, a monk who's got some... Uh, I can't remember exactly the the full episode, but he had some issues going on, like uh, doubts and stuff, and it was just a really good uh, episode. Okay, but do you also think thematically it plays throughout the show enough that that there's an angle there? Oh, yes. Yes, uh, because there's a one particular... Uh, there's one... One uh, character who that's that's all that's all she is is just uh, all about faith, and okay. that plays out throughout the series. 
no, I, like I said, it sounds interesting, and I feel bad because I don't remember the show that well. I remember they were searching for something on some planet, and I, I seem to remember that had to do something with faith, like. Uh, and, and that 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 was that was the other part because throughout the um, throughout the whole series, it's um, well towards the the second second uh, season, it starts dealing with um, basically the, the basic good versus evil, and you have these two groups. Uh, major powers that are basically one is for good and one is for evil, and they pretty much catch everybody else in the middle, fight pretty much fighting their battle and stuff. So it's, um, so the the one one of the lead characters actually goes to this planet to, um, try to destroy like the ultimate evil and sacrifices himself in the process, and then he's, and then he's kind of like, you could say he's like reborn, brought back to life, and uh, a lot of other people kind of look at him as a messiah type of thing, so it's a real interesting storyline. Right, yeah, now that brings back, yeah, I remember I kind of was on the right path or whatever, but yeah, everything you just said, uh, someone being reborn, uh, that's that's pretty, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty probably religious. And sci-fi does that, by the way. I don't know, do people in this room, have you heard of or seen Babylon 5? Um you know, most sci-fi is pretty mythic in terms of what it taps into, whether it's Star Wars or Babylon 5, what have you. Um, that's kind of the nature of, of, of sci-fi to, to a certain degree. So, yeah, that sounds terrific. Um, let's see. Who else has the ability to speak and would like to go? Um, I can. Yeah. No okay. I'm doing mine's on... Oh, yeah, my name is Kalani. I'm doing mines on Guild Wars 2. Uh, it's made by ArenaNet, and it's heavily PvP. So my audience would be people who like to play MMOs that are mostly into PvP. Okay. Since they're doing tournaments now, they started doing pretty much major tournaments. Okay, so who should give Guild Wars 2 a try that normally wouldn't care about it or pass it by or think, ah, this isn't for me? Uh, most people that like story, in a way. Okay, but it's Guild... that much in there. Okay, I was going to say, is Guild Wars 2 really uh, story-based, though? Uh, not really. They kind of drop you off in, like your character area then you gotta just do quests but they don't really tell you where and then you just run around doing dynamic events okay there must be people in the but room pretty who... much we... yeah go ahead yeah, but... uh, they pretty much max level you and give you all your skills when you go into pvp and so it's like an equal fight <laughs> Okay, classmates, there must be some MMO, MMO players on here. People play World of Warcraft or League of Legends or things like that. Do I have any experts in the room? Jerica says no. <laughs> I'm hoping someone can help Kalani out. No. <laughs> um, or maybe we can brainstorm. Who could possibly... Because I think... I'm not a PC gamer, but I think Guild Wars 2, isn't it pretty accurate to say that you like you, you join a guild, right, a faction, and that you spend most of your time uh, either completing quests or attacking other guilds and trying to take them over? Is that right, Kalani? Well, it's, it's mostly PvE outside of arenas, so you could Guild versus Guild if you queue for it. Okay, but there is like a player versus player component. Yeah, there is. Jeremy says he's a casual player. So who should give Guild Wars 2 a try? Uh, and why? Because it's not just about identifying the unexpected audience, but kind of making a case for why they might be interested in it. Um, and this is where I feel, at a bit of, uh, I feel at a bit of a loss. And I don't know, maybe for you, going too far out of bounds might not... I don't know. Do World of Warcraft people play Guild Wars too, or are they sort of like completely different camps? They kind of drifted into Guild Wars two, but then there was no late game, so they just quit. 
Okay. Because WoW has a lot of late game and stuff. Yeah. Well, I think you'll have to brainstorm. This is where I felt feel bad because I'm not sure I can help much. I was hoping that that someone else in the room could help. Uh, like, uh, who could get? Who would like Guild Wars two? Even if they, on the surface, don't think they could really get into it. Um, I don't know if there's a strong social component. Maybe there's something you can do there where people would think that they're not interested in this would would like it. If there is a, a social interaction or component thing. Uh, I was going with the World of Warcraft thing because if World of Warcraft people like have no interest in Guild Wars two, then maybe they could be an unexpected audience that would love it if they'd give it a, char- a tr- uh, try and you know take a break from uh, from World of Warcraft. Uh, but yeah, Kalani, you'll have to do a bit of brainstorming to figure out like an unexpected audience. Video games can be tough, by the way. Uh, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Is there anybody else out there who has the ability to, to speak and wants to kind of share what they're what they're thinking of? I could also actually just hold on a second. I could go back up the chat window because Jericho is writing about Firefly says an unexpected audience could be the political drama enthusiasts uh, versus just sci-fi or Western. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I get a little bit lost here. It starts off political drama enthusiasts. Uh, There's there's so much information I'm having trouble seeing what the unexpected audience specifically could could be. Are other people familiar with Firefly, a television show from over from about ten years ago? No. No. <laughs> well, no. Jeremy says yes. I loved it. Yeah. So okay. So who could like Firefly, even though they don't know anything about it? Uh. I th- I think Jerica might have been saying that people are normally fans of either just sci-fi or westerns could give it a try because uh, one of the odd things about Firefly is it's it's a hybrid show. It takes basically a western and a, a, a sci-fi sort of you know spaceship uh, storyline and smashes the two together, which was too jarring for some because it's really weird to see the spaceship settle down on a planet. Everybody's you know riding around in horses and buggies and robbing banks. Uh, so yeah, maybe there's something there that normally people are strict enthusiasts of, of either of those shows could, could give Firefly a chance. Um, Jerrica, you actually, I think have a a wide spectrum to choose from because, you know, I'd say that also people are interested in character driven shows, um, Mm -hmm. could like it because like the essay that you had to read for your source analysis kind of, kind of emphasize that, that it's not like, typical sci-fi with aliens and big explosions it's really a human centered show so people might pass on thinking ah, i don't care about spaceships or or cowboys might be surprised that it's actually a bit deeper under the hood uh donald says he's writing about the avengers well wow, it must be like joss whedon night in here because i already mentioned cabin in the woods jarek mentioned firefly which is a joss whedon show and and uh he directed the avengers uh, the preview showed it to be an all-action movie. The movie also had some comedy sense. Uh, it's a Marvel movie where heroes join forces. Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure if I'm following you, Donna. Are you saying that people who appreciate comedy should give the Avengers a try, even if they think that they're not into superhero or action movies? Um, if, if that's a sense, and yeah, I guess I could see that, right? Because that's one of the things that thrilled me about when I read a long time ago that Joss Whedon was going to be the director of the Avengers, because he he knows how to handle ensemble casts and he's he's also really good at dealing handling comedy. So yeah, the Avengers um, probably has more jokes in it than the typical uh, comic book based movie. I mean, sure, you know they have a few laughs thrown in here or there, but the Avengers actually had several big laughs um, where they kind of go all out. Uh, and that's that's pretty that's pretty rare. Although that remake of the Spider Man, did you see that the Amazing Spider Man that came out like what about a year and a half ago or something? I finally saw that, and that's actually pretty funny too. It's kind of cute. Uh, but yeah, Donald, that sounds like a, a, a good path. Let's see. I think we've heard from everybody except Sierra. Uh, Sierra, either out loud or in the chat window. Can you remind us what you're writing about and what you're thinking in terms of unexpected audience?
And we didn't hear from Corey. He took off. Hmm. Oh, that reminds me. Uh, I gotta, I gotta share the secret password. Uh, the password for tonight is Mississippi. Um, by the way, those of you uh, in this room, I, I mean, I don't mind when I get an email from you with the password, but you don't need to email me anything. This is just for people who are going to watch this session later to get um, fewer extra credit points than you all will get, but at least they'll get something. Uh, Sierra s says she's writing about The Walking Dead. Okay, and Sierra, any idea about an unexpected audience? Like who would normally think, ah, The Walking Dead is my thing, but if they gave it a chance, they might love it. And Sierra says, middle-aged. Uh, I feel the younger viewers tend to like zombies more. Um, okay, that's a good place to start. I would think what you also have to answer the question why. So what is it, what is it about uh, middle-aged people that would make them interested in The Walking Dead? Because um, there's there are two things here: one to identify an unexpected audience, but then sort of kind of explain your decision why. For instance, I could say that, uh, I don't know, uh, prepubescent boys living in the town of Evansville, Indiana, could like The Walking Dead. That would certainly be an unexpected audience, but it would also seem kind of arbitrary. Uh, so why would older viewers like The Walking Dead? And other people can chime in if they think they have an opinion. By the way, I'm not even going to ask what Sierra's definition of middle-aged is, uh, <laughs> because young people always unintentionally insult me, because, I don't know, I'm 41, I think I'm still young, but then it turns out when I speak to people sometimes, I guess I'm not, so maybe I'm middle-aged too. To, uh, Sierra Kalani says, I think drama lovers would like The Walking Dead due to the loss of friends, etc., um, okay. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, that's a big surprise about the walking dead, right? And not even just the walking dead, but these other shows like breaking bad that even though on the surface, they deal with things like zombies and making meth and maybe you're into that, maybe not. Uh, but I think the, the reason these shows get so many people tuning in every week when they're on the air, that is, is because they're, they're so well written, right? They're so well acted out. They're dramas first and foremost, um, the Walking Dead, you can go weeks without zombies appearing at all, practically. And if you go online, you'll hear plenty of people actually complain about that. But uh, most people love it for that very reason, um, because it's it's doing something different. Sierra says she's thinking more of the drama as well. Um, okay, yeah, and I think your challenge, Sierra, will be to sort of connect the dots. Like, uh, if you're going to stick with the kind of, you know, older audience... Um, you'll have to kind of make a case for why specifically they would be attracted to the show. Um, is there something about family? Is there something about, I don't know, lived experience and the, the idea of having to fend for yourself in this new environment, maybe it would be more meaningful to someone who's spent more years on this planet than others. I don't know. I'm just brainstorming. Um, okay. Okay. Believe it or not, we're pretty much coming to the end because we only have, uh, well, as I said, one person ditched the room without participating. So that puts me in the mean situation of, does that person earn extra credit points or not? Uh, but he took off. So we only have like six people here, which is about half the amount we had last week. So it's 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 normal. That this session will, will run a bit shorter. I think I've got everybody's names down. Uh, Sierra, Matthew, Kalani, Jerrica, Jeremy, and Donald. Uh, before I close the session, does anybody have like uh, questions they want to ask me now? Especially since I'll be out of town and kind of intermittently checking in. Is there any important things so either about the assignment that's coming up or the course in general that you, you want to ask now before we close the session? No. <laughs> I'm going to take that. You know, it's, it's really weird. I've been at full sale for about six months. I'd say for the first four months, the, the go-to sessions were, like, really lively. People loved chiming in. I'm By the way, I'm not criticizing. But both last month and this month, I just think I've got quieter people. Not that that's bad, but um, you try. I, I putting a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, would my thing be considered, I mean, I don't expect the audience to be casual gamers just to try out the game? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, that sounds very broad. I mean, casual gamers. What does that mean? You mean like casual gamers, like anything that your mother will play? Okay, but by that definition, would your mother really want to give Guild War to uh, Guild Wars to a, a try? It's it's new player friendly, so I, I would think so. See, okay, here's the thing. I, I, I don't know Guild Wars 2, but let me just throw stuff out there, and it's probably way off. But here's here's where uh, you you need to be heading. Like maybe there's something about, I don't know, mil- military enthusiasts who love strategy games. Maybe there's an aspect of Guild War 2 that could attract those people, even though they wouldn't consider that sort of game. Uh, I already mentioned the social component. All these people who like to, you know, uh, play games where there's a strong like chat component or making friends component. If that's a strong feature of Guild Wars 2, maybe that could be a reason. Um, so I would, I would think along those kinds of lines. Um, okay. And I'm not sure if Sierra's okay. confused. Or not. She says she, she thought unexpected audience was those whom you don't expect to watch. Yeah, that's half right. You're trying to identify. It's almost like uh, you're an advertiser and you're trying to reach into an untapped market. So think about that in terms of your your video game, your film, your show like The Walking Dead. Which segment out there isn't watching that show but should and try to make a case for why they should be watching it? Um, You know, think back to my example I gave at the beginning with the horror film, right? People would pass on it thinking it's just lame-brained horror film, but I would convince them, no, if you're into indie films or you're into experimental films or really thoughtful, chance-taking films, you got to see this. That's what you're trying to do. Um, okay, any other questions before I shut things down? I'm going to take that complete and utter silence as a no. So with that, uh, everybody have a great weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. Um, you, I, my, my hours, my adjusted hours are posted on the dashboard, and I also sent an email. So if you need to find me, if you don't remember those hours, just look for me. Sometimes I'll be on iChat and other times... Other times I won't. Um, But if we have nothing else to kind of go over, I'm going to end the meeting. Um, So good night, everybody.